Okay, can people hear me? Okay, thanks. So cool. So the third homework is now out. It should be mostly type one fun, I think. Problem one, two, three, and four should be type one. Problem six might be type two. Problem five is gonna be somewhere between type two and type three. If problem six is, if problem five is type one fun for you, then you have really mastered multivariable calculus. That is the only way. Problem five is hard. That's why the first part has 25 points, but it's a very general relation between CP and CV. And uh, I can give you one hint. You have to really think of the internal energy as a function of different variables. So there was, we have done, you know, we have talked about how internal energy can be expressed as a function of pressure or temperature or volume or temperature. And, and this is for a constant composition system, if that wasn't obvious. So N is not a variable. We are not worrying about N, but uh, apart from that, P, V, T are there. So you have to think how to manipulate all that. So problem five part A is tricky. It will take time. Other problems are not very hard. So Lucas had asked a question this morning about problem two, where it has two parts. It has one part where it wants you to calculate the work done under a certain pathway and the second part you have to calculate the work done under a different pathway. The first pathway is, the second pathway mentions it is done reversibly. The first pathway does not say anything about reversibly. So this goes back to the example that we did in class where we put in the expression for the work done integral uh, PDV. Let's see, Connor, can you let in people? Because I think people are still not using the UMD thing and that thing is such a mess that, so if people are in the waiting room, could you please let them in, Connor? Sure. Thanks. We will assume they are all students. If not, well, if they really want to learn PCAM, man, it's fine. So, so let me do, go to my screen now and then I will start talking about a little bit about problem two and that allows us to come to the, Second law. Any questions, by the way? Okay. So recall that DW is given by minus p external dv and this p external is equal to p system this is the condition of mechanical equilibrium right it won't happen all the time and when do we have mechanical or thermal equilibrium that is when the process is being carried out reversibly so in general, reverse, and I will draw the arrow with uh, head both sides. Reversibility is what means that P external is equal to P system, or in, if you are, uh, it, it could also have implications for the temperature. But in this case, we are talking about pressure. So for the first part of the problem, you just have to assume constant external pressure and work with it. And second part of the problem, you can actually use the equation of state. In this case, it is an ideal gas, so use ideal gas equation of state. I could have generalized the problem for, uh, this is problem two in homework. Uh, homework three, problem two, but I'm not doing a, I'm not working through the problems. I'm just trying to launch off here into second law. So even if you don't care about the problem, this is, this is very generic. So I'm saying that and it applies to problem two. And uh, I must point out problem five is, hard. It will make you slightly sad. It's tricky. Keep time for problem five. Don't think you have done everything and you will do problem five part A in 20 minutes. It will take time. <clears throat> Cool. So, and then we can make a mustache. Okay. So, 
so the point here is that the work done on a system is always given by P external multiplied by change in volume, which is expansion work. It is only if the process is being carried out reversibly, which means the system is at equilibrium that we can replace P external. Part two is in part two is reversible. So you can use the equation of state. So when a process is being carried out reversibly, it allows us to use equation of state. In this case, it's an ideal gas law, so we can use that. And similar ideas apply to other problems. So that's all I wanted to say. But the key finding from this problem, the reason this is interesting is you will find, hopefully, something, uh, if you recall, we did this a couple, a couple of weeks ago, where we looked at pressure volume work in a process which was being carried out reversibly versus where we dr immediately dropped the pressure down, down to a certain um, pressure. Remember this one? And the idea here was that the work done under this reversible process is the area under the curve always, is going to be always higher than the work done irreversibly when you just jam the pressure down or up or whatever you want to do with it. So, and I mentioned back then that this really connects to second law of thermodynamics. And that's, that's something to remember as we move ahead today. So, so far we were looking at, we looked at this example where we had a ball bouncing and each time the ball bounced off the ground, it bounced a bit, it bounced up in the air, but the amount of height that it went up kept going down as a function of time. And what would it do every time? It would release some heat into the ground. So in this case, there is work being done against the gravitational field, and that work is being converted into, uh, into heat. So work is being converted into heat. And I asked you to think about the reverse process where the ball starts from here and starts to suck heat out of the ground and rises up. So the red one is the ball going up and the black one is the ball going down. And in the, in the red one, we would have heat being converted into work. And the main point last time was that first law of thermodynamics does not distinguish between these two. First law of thermodynamics is a bookkeeping law. First law of thermodynamics says, well, you started with this much energy, you ended with this much energy, the balance went to this, it all checks out, we are good. It doesn't tell you which direction is preferred. You can think of it as an example. Many of you are probably, some of you might already be paying taxes or you have definitely heard about it. And you might be, or if not, you will be soon paying taxes and April is always a horrible time. So you can think of it as per first law of thermodynamics your tax money going to the government is allowed and tax money coming from the government to you is also allowed. Both are fine because the total amount of money, if you think of money as energy, it is conserved. But it doesn't happen. Money always goes from us to the government. There is a directionality. And second law of thermodynamics really talks about this directionality, not so much in the context of money, but in the context of energy. And now is a good point of time to recall how did we distinguish between work and heat? If we go back to very, very first class, let me open it if I can find it. I think it was, did we do it here? No, we did it after this. We did it on 9.9. We did it somewhere, I will waste a lot of time, but uh, hopefully you will recall that we talked about, does anyone remember what is the difference between work and heat that we discussed from a molecular perspective very early on? Heat's uh, like a random motion, whereas work is organized motion. Precisely, the difference is randomness. Thanks a little bit. Work is organized motion, heat is randomness. So what we are basically seeing here 
is that organized motion can be changed into randomness, but it is hard to go the other way. You cannot have just randomness come back into organized motion. And this is something we see all the time. You know, you're playing pool or something, you have balls stacked together, you can hit the balls and they will all go everywhere. They won't just come back. And this doesn't follow from first law of thermodynamics. In fact, it doesn't follow from Newton's law of motion. If I was to write down Newton's law of motion for you, how does Newton's law of motion look like? Newton's law of motion, F is equal to mass time acceleration, can be written in a differential form. It can be written as d square x by dt square. That's the acceleration. So mass multiplied by d square x by dt square is equal to some force F. And uh, this Newton's law of motion is time reversible. What it means that if you take T and change it to minus T, Newton's law of motion does not prohibit it. You can go and write down everything here and you will see the equation still applies. You can run a system forward, you can run a system backward. Just on the basis of Newton's law of motion, you cannot distinguish whether a system is going ahead in time or back in time. But second law thermodynamics tells us that there is a direction of time. There is a preferred direction of time, which says that the preferred direction of time is, whose preferred direction of time? Not mine or yours, but nature's. Nature prefers randomness. That's the key essence of second law of thermodynamics. It prefers a direction of change that leads to dispersal of energy. Those of you who will be taking PCAM 482, or those of you who will be taking biochem 461 or whatever it is, biophysical chemistry and things, these things will become very, this concept will become very important there also. So don't, this is universally important for chemists, for biochemists, for everyone, this dispersal of energy. So it means that if you have an organized way of keeping a system, let's say these are atoms and they're acting like this, nature would prefer that the system goes into somewhere where the energies can be distributed in many different ways because in this way on the left you have a very well organized pattern there are only one or two patterns which can be like this on the right side you can dis distort the system in as many ways as you want so i should have less same number of atoms in both i didn't mean to increase the number of atoms on five so and our laws of thermodynamics, these statements actually quantify this hopefully intuitive idea. So what does it mean? So we last time we had talked about two laws of thermodynamics. We had, I had just introduced these statements and today we will work through them, both of them. So the first one is called Kelvin statement. It is named after Lord Kelvin, which says that no process is possible in which the sole result is absorption of heat from a reservoir. And we are gradually introducing some terms here. We are talking about a reservoir and it's complete conversion into work. So I had given you an example of photosynthesis, for example, when plants do photosynthesis, I think the energy efficiency of a plant, it's a machine, right? It's taking heat from the atmosphere, that's our reservoir, and it's complete, and it's converting it into some sort of, plants don't really move, but they do work in their own ways, right? They are transporting things from point A to point B. And the efficiency, I think, is five to 10% even in nature. I might be wrong, but I, I think that's, that's what it is. Most of the heat 
just gets wasted in different forms. So what Kelvin statement is telling you, you cannot just eat a small amount of food and completely convert it into energy. You will be wasting. There will be always waste. So let's think of our ball jumping off the floor example and see why the forward direction is in agreement with Kelvin's statement and the backward direction is in disagreement with Kelvin's statement. So in the forward direction, you are doing work against the, the, the environment is doing work on you, the gravity is doing work on you and you're converting that into heat. So there is no problem. Heat is not being converted into work. In the forward direction, work is being converted into heat. So no problem at all. Let's look at the backward direction. In the backward direction, you can directly see its problem. You are taking heat from a reservoir, which is the ground, and doing it to perform work against gravity. And that is prohibited by Kelvin's statement of second law of thermodynamics. And uh, <clears throat> that is one statement. The other statement that I introduced, and we will soon see that they are equivalent, so these people, you will see this heat and work, all of this really started because people were interested in making machines, engines. You know, we didn't have trains 200 years ago or whatever, something around then. And people were trying to figure out how to make these things more efficient. And they were coming up to fundamental limits. And that's when they sorted all of this. Clausius statement says heat does not spontaneously and spontaneously is just a way of saying preferred direction of change. I emphasized last time and I want to emphasize it again. Spontaneously is not the same as instantaneously. Even if a preferred direction of change is spontaneous, it doesn't mean it will happen instantaneously. For example, your rooms getting disorganized. Of course, if you don't do anything, it will become disorganized. That is the spontaneous direction of change. It won't happen immediately, right? It will take time. And the more and more time you give it, the more and more disorganized it will become. It will become. Clausius' statement says that heat does not spontaneously flow from a colder body to a hotter body some work has to be done in order for this to happen. So let's look at Kelvin statement and we can draw Kelvin statement as a nice cute little diagram. We can draw it in the following form. So Kelvin, we can draw as a box, which we call as a hot source, which is at a higher temperature. Let's say at some temperature T2, T is equal to T2. And from this hot source, we are taking heat to drive some sort of motor, okay? This heat comes, it could be water that is being heated up, then the water is producing steam and the steam is so violent that you take it to move a turbine and the turbine actually moves something and things start moving, it drives your car, you know, it could be a steam engine. So this is a motor which can, rotate in some direction or do some sort of mechanical motion. And this motor, as it moves, allows us to extract some work, some useful work. So, but for example, these could be your muscles. So you have consumed a bunch of energy and your muscles are the motors which work. And now you go and run very, very fast. Oh, by the way, those of you who like running, you should totally check out the London Marathon this Sunday. It's, I know there are at least few runners in the audience. It's, uh, so you know, all marathons got canceled, right? So this one is only an elite field marathon, which is, some of you might recognize the name of Kipchoge, Eliud Kipchoge, and he's going to run against Bekele. These are the only two people that current best times in a full marathon. Kipchoge is 2.01.39, two hour, one minutes and 39 seconds. If you have run on a treadmill, it is pretty close to the fastest speed that you can take on a treadmill for full two hours. That's what it is. And his best time at that distance is 2.01.41. They are apart by two seconds at a marathon distance, 26 miles. And they are going to compete. So I'm going to be up at 5.15 a.m. to watch this. It's going to be awesome. Anyway, that was a distraction. I never said it. So, 
So Kelvin's, I got reminded of this because of course Kipchoge cannot just consume food and be like, oh, I'm going to work so hard. He's going to sweat. He's going to have all sorts of dissipative things that happen. And in running or in any sport, often it is a question of how do you take care of this dissipation? So this, as per Kelvin, this is not possible. You cannot just take energy from a hot source and convert it into work. You always need what is called a cold sink. Let me draw it in a different diagram altogether because people who look at the notes can then be confused. So what is possible looks as follows. Maybe I can just draw it on the last page so you can look at it together. Okay, I will draw it a bit smaller. So what is possible it seems like in spite of the bigger iPad, my writing has gradually expanded. You can say it has expanded reversibly and tried to take up more of the space. But what is possible that you have a hot source and you take heat from the hot source and use it to drive a motor and this motor consume, uh, produces work, but it also gives out some heat to what is called a cold sink. And I will zoom it in so you can look at it carefully. So over here we have a hot source from which is heat is taken in. And here we have heat given out. So you know that is the all the energy that Kipchoge or the marathon runner is wasting. And in the end, it is all about how efficient can you be in all of this. And uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting that different sources of energy, because we have a lot of biochemists in the classroom, different sources of energy have their own different efficiency. When you have carbohydrates, for example, the efficiency, and you can define an efficiency now, eta, which is defined, so let's call it Q in, and let's call this as Q out. You can define an efficiency which is the work that you get out of the system divided by the heat in. And let's write a modular sign so that you don't have to worry about the signs. So eta of carbohydrates, carbohydrate is not a machine, but it is the energy source. So for eta for carbohydrates typically tends to be quite higher than eta for fat. You can get a lot of, in fact, the fat content that we have in our body worth around uh, 20,000 kilocalories. So people who run ultra marathons, they are very specialized in burning the fat very, very slowly. So it's a whole transition. They are very good fat burners. They, can, they don't have to run very fast. They will run at a slightly slower speed, but they can keep running very long. While the marathon runners and especially fast runners have to be very... Kipchoge is going to win? I don't know. I'm, I'm rooting for Bekele. Have you seen Bekele run? He's awesome. He's, he's on track. Bekele has beat Kipchoge many, many times. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's come back to Kipchoge. <laughs> so the, oh, okay. That's, okay. Then, <laughs> sure. I, I would like a, either. So let's not get into Kenya versus Ethiopia war over here. <laughs> they are both very good friends, I must point out. So good. So Joyce, you might be up with me at 5.15 a.m. I hope so. We can, now let's not set up a Zoom party. It would be too much, too much Zoom. Okay, cool. I will celebrate if Kipchoge wins. I like him a lot. He's great. He's amazing. He's so modest. He's a multimillionaire. <laughs> we got into it. Okay, cool. Now let's get back to PCAM. It, uh, PCAM. So the only difference for the possible process is having a cold sink that takes in wasted heat. That's all it comes back to. Yeah, exactly. That's why it's called wasted. So, and in fact, so what this is telling us, uh, one way of looking at the Kelvin statement is that eta is always going to be smaller than one. Eta can never become one. The efficiency is always going to be smaller than one. And uh, I should have maybe done this on a new page, but so together now here, we can think of all of this, everything in blue, taxes equal to cold sink, depends on who is the system. The taxes do useful things also. 
the system is everything in the blue box which is performing work on the surroundings so the system is performing work on the surroundings and uh, together systems plus surrounding is our universe right there is nothing else so the another way of looking at this kelvin statement is as you saw it's quite simple that there will be we always need we always have a cold sink where heat is dissipated now dissipated is a funny word it sounds complicated but it is really the same as wasted what does wasted mean well, wasted means you go out drinking or whatever and you come back and you're wasted right but that's the same idea well it's, it's kind of different here dissipated means that you have something organized and you have changed it into completely random we will be looking at two definitions of entropy so so far we haven't really talked about what is entropy and we are getting there in a moment but when we get to entropy this randomness will become clearer when at the second definition of entropy for now we haven't mentioned even entropy but now is the first time that we do it so system plus surrounding so you had the system what did the system comprise of the system comprised of a hot source motor and a sink and a cold sink right all these three things together can you still attempt to use that heat out in another process so it is not fully wasted alexander matthew butler very good question very good question we will get to that we will we will try to do that we will take the heat out of this and connect it to another motor and see what goes on it will be happening you know what makes solar cells so inefficient Elizabeth, you should answer that question for me. Figure it out and answer it on Slack, okay? Good. I'm going to bug you if you don't answer it for me. In fact, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Look it up. And, you know, that's... So, Department of Energy has... Department of Energy's most funded project. So, I did my grad school at Caltech, and there, there was a big center called Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. It's like a billion-dollar center from Department of Energy. And their whole motive is to come up with materials that can increase the efficiency in solar cells. And it's not so easy because often you have to keep in mind the elements that are very efficient, the production of these elements is quite expensive, right? And if in producing these elements, you're wasting a lot of energy, then what is the point? And that's, that's a whole different discussion. We'll get to these type of applied aspects of thermodynamics later, but for now, let's stick with a bit of theory. So system is hot source, motor plus cold sink. Surroundings are everything else on which work is being done. Together, these two are called the universe. This is our definition of universe in PCAN. So, so the first law does not... Is it frozen? The screen is frozen, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. This has gotten a bit better, I think. I don't know why it froze. So we can think of two cases in the system plus surrounding. We can think of a case in which there is a cold sink and a second case in which there is no cold sink. As per first law of thermodynamics, first law does not distinguish whether we had a cold sink or not. As per first law of thermodynamics, there is no difference. Why? Because delta Q plus delta U is equal to delta W is very, is the same. So yeah, I want to give a shout out to Oluwadra if I got your name pronounced correctly. He has been working on the solar district of 
which is a collegiate department of energy competition. And he's exactly trying to do this along with his team. I highly encourage you to talk to him on Slack. You're welcome to set up a different channel for that. It's, it's, it's very, I'm very supportive of these type of efforts, different projects. We won't have a different channel for every project, but you know, if you can, if you think that any sort of PKM can help you in something outside, uh, in some project that you're working on, we can, I'm happy to support in that in any way. So first law does not distinguish whether we had a cold sink or not. As per first law, we are the same. What does distinguish these two cases is second law. And more specifically now, what distinguishes these two is a quantity that measures spontaneity. So it starts to get a bit abstract right around here. So I've been a bit slowish so in the last two, three days because it, it will start to ramp up from here and I wanted you, you to become acclimatized with how things are. So we talked about spontaneous change and spontaneity is, what is it? It's a noun not of spontaneous change, right? Spontaneous is the adjective, spontaneity is the noun. So there is a quantity that measures spontaneity. This quantity is called entropy. And its symbol is S. We will define it in lots of details. We will be defining it in many ways, trying to see how those definitions are equivalent, whether this quantity can be defined just given N, V, and T, that is whether it is a state function or not, that has to be seen, turns out it is. So, so far, entropy is a quantity that measures the direction of spontaneity, or it measures spontaneity. And you can see what it means. Things that are organized will have less entropy. Things that are disorganized will have higher entropy. That's the idea. And uh, by these two, whether we, whether we have a cold sink or not, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not the laws. I'm talking about the cold, whether we have a cold sink or not. So Daisy is correct. So what second law says, and this is the third statement of second law really, because we looked at the Kelvin statement, we looked at the Clausius statement, what the third law, second law says, or third statement is that entropy of universe, what do we mean by universe? It sounds very grand, but what it really means is the isolated system, a fully isolated system. Isolated system is not an adiabatically closed system. You can still do work on an adiabatically closed system. Remember that, right? Isolated system is adiabatic, so no heat, no mass, plus no work. A fully isolated system. That's why isolated system is system plus surrounding. Entropy of the universe increases in the course of spontaneous change. That is delta S total is more than zero. And this is possibly the most mathematical statement of the second law of thermodynamics. All three statements are equivalent. We will look at the equivalence in different ways. We haven't yet really rigorously defined entropy. I have given you an intuitive definition. Turns out the intuitive definition is actually easier to deal with than the exact definition. But this is what we have. Any questions so far? before we get into what exactly is entropy? You said for an isolated system, it's ADU, uh, what? Delta, entropy of universe for an isolated system increases in the course of spontaneous change. That is delta S total system plus surrounding more than zero. Does it help? Good. This is a very important point because this is already you are uh, you are ready to deal with people who use this second law thermodynamics to say evolution is not possible because when you are thinking about evolution, clearly we are all becoming more and more organized. I mean, look at the biological complexity, but what you are ignoring there is the surroundings. You are talking about the order that is happening in the human body or humanity on its own, ignoring the lack of entropy, the decree, the increase in entropy, which might be happening for the universe, the heat that we are getting out of the system. So the, my point here is I cannot use second law of thermodynamics 
to either prove or disprove evolution. I'm not saying that I can use second law of thermodynamics to prove evolution. Actually, I cannot. If life was so simple, it would have been great. I cannot. But I cannot use second law of thermodynamics to either prove or disprove evolution. It does not apply because evolution or evolution uh, creationists tend to focus on the system and they completely ignore the surrounding. You have to go and calculate the entropy increase for the sun and the nuclear processes that are going on there. And that, that's mess. I don't think anyone has done that. You have to really go to the full universe and good luck with that. So, okay. So let's get to what this entropy is. And I hope you watched the video I posted on Slack by MC Hawking. I find it quite funny. He defines entropy in a variety of ways. It's, it's, aimed to, it's aimed after Stephen Hawking when he was still alive. I don't know if it's actually his sound in it or not, but it might be. So entropy S can be defined in two ways. Both are equivalent. The first way is the classical way. And the second way is the molecular way. There is a classical way and there is a molecular way. The molecular way started around 1905 or so. The classical way is 1700s and is still valid. It's going to be, it's not that the molecular way came and overrooted the classical way. The molecular way came later. The molecular way really is due to Boltzmann while these things are due to Kelvin, Clausius, all these people of thermodynamics. The molecular way also came later because until early 1900s, people simply didn't think that matter is made up of atoms or molecules. They thought it's all an ether, it's, and which, is, which was, so when Boltzmann came up with this molecular perspective that things, his, his way of looking at entropy was essentially dependent on things being discrete. And this was a very controversial view in, uh, especially in Germany in early 20th century in 1900 or so. So <clears throat> I, will, I will first talk about the classical way. I will also tell you the molecular way. In this class, we are going to spend a lot of time talking about the classical way. I will maybe talk one class about the molecular way and we will see why they are equivalent. But otherwise we are going to focus on the classical way. So classical way does not talk about entropy. It talks about change in entropy. It says that as per classical way, entropy change. So it does not define entropy itself. And that's quite important. In fact, this is something I should have mentioned earlier. All these energies that we are talking about, we don't accept equipartition. We didn't really talk about the absolute value of the energy, right? We always talk about delta U or delta Q or delta W, right? We are always interested in change in energy. So that's why here also we are talking about change in entropy. It just so happens when we get to third law of thermodynamics or this also called the zeroth law of thermodynamics, it will tell us that the entropy is zero at zero Kelvin. But for now we are talking about change in entropy and classical formula for change in entropy is that entropy change is defined as heat transferred divided by temperature at which the heat was transferred in a reversible process. And this is where this reversibility concept starts to become super important. So we are talking about DS and notice that here I did not write down as D cut S, right? So I'm already telling you that this entropy is going to turn out to be a state function. Proving it is complicated, but we will look at the proof in full glory. DS is equal to Q reversible by T. So if you have a process that is going from some, so this is a differential change. This is a small change, right? For a very small amount. And it, 
I, I want you to focus on this equation and really see it's, it's, it's small, but it's got things written in a very compact manner. On the left hand side, it tells us S is a state function, so we can use D. On the right hand side, we know very well that Q, even if it's reversible, will depend on the path taken, right? Different paths will have different heat done, uh, heat change involved in the process. So if the, but this is a differential change. This is a very, very tiny change. That's why we have the D hanging out. But if the process is actually taking you from some point I to some point F, if the process is going from reversible, the subscript says reversible, REV. If the process is going from state I to state F, then the change in entropy delta S will be given by the integral of delta Q reversible by T. So because the temperature might be changing, right? If it's an isothermal process, then you could get the one over temperature out. This is a really powerful relation. It tells you that, let's say in the PV diagram, if you're going from point A to point B, there could be one path that you take, a reversible path that looks like this, a reversible path that looks like this, some other reversible path that looks like this, a fourth reversible path that looks like this. All of them will have, they are reversible. So you're going slowly along each of them reversibly. All of them will have their own delta Q reversible or integral of delta Q reversible, which will depend on the path that you took. However, instead of that, if you integrate a delta Q reversible by T, it will be path independent. That just blows my mind. I think that's, sorry, I was writing exactly opposite. thing. It will be path independent. So even though delta Q reversible integral depends on the path, integral of delta Q reversible by T is path independent. And this is basically saying that entropy is a state function. We haven't proven it yet. We will prove this shortly. So that's the classical definition of entropy. And it's really powerful because what it tells us that maybe you had some complicated reversible path, pressure and volume, but it could have been pressure and temperature. It could have been some other level. You know, it could have even been N if we were looking at composition change in a system. So it's pressure and volume. So it's really powerful because it tells us that in order to calculate the entropy difference between state A and state B or state I and state F, you don't have to care about what path you take. You have to find any reversible path and go from I to F and you will get the entropy difference. That's because it's a state function. So this is the classical definition of entropy. The molecular definition of entropy is something you might have, more of you have probably seen, even if you haven't seen this DS DQ reversible by T and uh, which, Oh, they are both valid and they are always going to be valid. They are equivalent. So this one says S is equal to K natural log of W, where W is the multiplicity or of the system. W is the number of ways you can arrange a system. KB is Boltzmann constant. And if you can arrange a system in many different ways, W will be higher and the entropy will be higher. If you can arrange the system in just one way, entropy will be zero. So this law, so notice the difference. This, uh, uh, this law does not talk about, uh, looking through screens. Sorry about that. This law does not talk about delta S. This law is actually talking about S while the classical law is talking about change in entropy. So this law is also telling us, Ellen, when I, when I write log, it is always log to the base E. 
as per construction. I will not use LN. It, in fact, if I want to use any other base, I will specify what is the base. So log in 481 by default is natural log. This reminds me of one of the most useless trivial things that I have stored in my head. Does anyone, you know, the natural log brings us to this number E, right? It is so interesting that E, I remember it will tell 10 decimal digits and it's so easy and you just see why. It looks like this. Isn't it crazy that four digits just repeat entirely? I find it very interesting. I don't know what's the reason. And then nothing repeats like this. It just happens in the first 10 digits. Anyway, so this is the molecular definition of entropy. S is equal to K log W. It's also called Boltzmann's formula. And I want to show you something and then I will uh, stop today's class. Has any of you been to Vienna? Anyone's been to Vienna? Nearly the airport. Airport doesn't count. Has any more, more specifically, has anyone been to the cemetery in Vienna? If you go to the cemetery in Vienna, it's, it's a very exciting place. Vienna, not in Virginia. They named it after that Vienna, sorry. This is Vienna in Austria. If you go to the central cemetery in Vienna, it is the most exciting cemetery that I have been to because it's got Boltzmann's grave with S is equal to K log W formula written over there. Next to Boltzmann, Mozart is buried or it's claimed that Mozart is buried even though his body is somewhere in Vienna. Beethoven is buried a little bit elsewhere. And uh, if you go to my, for those of you who will come to my 687 class, we'll see that it is also in the picture of my class. This is a picture I took when I visited them. I went for a conference and it was great. So this is Boltzmann's formula, S is equal to K log W. And it looks simpler to remember, right? If someone, <laughs> and uh, when Boltzmann came up with all of this, uh, the Germans especially just did not accept his way of thinking. He got very frustrated. He went to Trieste in Italy and uh, committed suicide in 1905. So he got so depressed because no one would accept what he was doing. So he just killed himself. As you can see, he was kind of depressed. So look, you can see from the beard, but uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so let's get back to our thermo. So we have S is equal to K log W, which is an easier formula to remember. And in biochemistry type subjects, or even in PCM 482, you will end up using this formula more. <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's fine. We always make this joke. In fact, my, where is that book? This book, this is a very good book on advanced thermodynamic states of matter. The introduction to this book begins Ludwig Boltzmann, who spent much of his life studying statistical mechanics, died in 1906 by his own hand. Paul Ehrenfest, carrying on the work, died similarly in 1933. Now it is our turn to study statistical mechanics. It's the introduction to thermodynamics and statistical mechanics of this book. It's a fun subject, as you can see. So these two very different looking formula are equivalent. And we will prove that equivalence. That will be a bit complicated. We will get to that. We will prove at some point. But right now, you have to take my word that there is no new information in these two formula. They are exactly the same. What we are going to do next class is to focus on this ds is equal to delta q reversible by t and calculate it for a few parts and see how it looks like. Then we will use this formula for the entropy change in the context of the third law and show that both Kelvin statement where we have a hot source 
from which a motor is running to do some work and Clausius statement, by the way, I can draw Clausius statement also. So next time we will use this to prove Kelvin statement or show that it is equivalent to Kelvin and Clausius. And I did not draw Clausius's, uh, Clausius statement picture, but it would simply look like hot source, cold sink, and heat is going out of hot cold sink into hot source, right? That is, that is uh, will we be ending on entropy before the midterm? Oh, entropy is gonna take a lot of time. We are stuck with entropy for a while. It's all about entropy for like next one month in different forms. Entropy will bring us to something called Helmholtz free energy and Gibbs energy, but it's nothing but entropy in a very specific setup. So and entropy is the bulk of the month. You will have entropy related questions in the, uh, in the midterm. So next time we are going to show that this formula for entropy is going to, is consistent with Kelvin and Clausius statement. And then we will move to showing that, we will, we will move to show that it is actually a state function. We will do it for an ideal gas and then we will do it for any gas and the proof for any gas is a bit complicated. So those of you who really want to read up ahead, the two main topics that are coming in the next few weeks is called, are called Carnot cycle. So we will probably be covering Carnot cycle before the midterm. And then after midterm, we will move to something called Clausius inequality. Clausius inequality will tell us, it will take this relation and turn it into an inequality for an irreversible process. So that's what, that is what uh, up next. But you can read up on the Carnot cycle. That's going to keep us busy for the next uh, class. Okay, and I wanna make one final uh, announcement, which is that on uh, Monday, next Monday, whatever the date is, what's the date on Monday? 28th, 5th, 5th of October, I think. Uh, I will be working through practice problems in class. So on Monday, 5th of October, we will not cover any new material. On Friday, on Wednesday, 7th of October, let me make sure I have the right dates. We will cover new material, but Monday, 5th of October, I will work through two or three problems in class or four problems, as many as we can. So Monday, no new material, but this Friday and 7th, we will have two materials, uh, two classes. So we have two classes of new material before the midterm. Fifth will be just problem solving. And okay, so see you on Friday.